You see, that's the thing about a whisper. You have to lean in. You have to get closer to the one who's whispering. What we're talking about here, my friends, is intimacy that leads to hearing God's voice directly in our spirit. But we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to hear the voice of God? Over the course of a few years, 
this wonderful, talented opera singer had actually damaged his own hearing with his own voice. And because the voice can only produce notes that it can hear, tragically, the singer was no longer able to sing certain notes because he could no longer hear them. This became known as the Tomatus Effect. And it was quite common until we learned how to wear earplugs and take better care of our hearing and all of those kind of things. The Tomatus Effect, in layman's terms, might be called selective hearing loss. Now, many of you who are sports fans have suffered from that. I remember growing up, I watched my father with selective hearing loss. He could be watching a Lions game, and my mother was carrying on a conversation within two feet of him, and he didn't hear a word. That's not what this is. This is different. The Tomatis effect is a loss of hearing, and in a spiritual sense, that's where we want to focus. As a young boy, the prophet Samuel said, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And God spoke to him. Now, in that case, Scripture records it was an audible voice. At least it appears to be in the context of that text from 1 Samuel 3. But then we come across these words in Psalm 95. He is our God. And we are the people of his pasture. The flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Have you ever heard the voice of God? Are you listening? Tuned in? Hearing the voice of God is where we will focus over the next few weeks. And this morning we borrow from Simon and Garfunkel of all places the sound of silence. Silence tends to make most of us nervous. But let's look at this in terms of its value. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of 1 Kings. This is not our only text. It's not really even our primary text, but it's where we're going to begin. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 13 is where we will read this morning. 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 9 through 13. Now, in order for this to make any sense, you have to know the story. Elijah was a prophet of God who lived around 900 B.C. And he had angered Jezebel. She was the wife of King Ahab, therefore a very powerful woman in Israel at that time. Her anger had to do with Elijah's treatment of the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. You may recall the story where Elijah challenged the 450 prophets of Baal to a duel of sorts. And they gathered on Mount Carmel, and both of them had their altars. And to make a longer story short for the sake of time today, basically God sent fire from heaven and consumed his altar, not just the offering, but the stones and the dirt around them. And it was confirmed, without a doubt, Baal was false. Yahweh, the God of Israel, was true. Elijah publicly embarrassed these prophets of Baal by showing Baal to be false. And then he had all 450 of them executed because Jewish law stated that prophets who prophesy false things should be stoned. And that's what he did. Because of that, Jezebel flew into a rage and she issued his death warrant. In fact, she sent a messenger to him and said, May I be dealt with ever so severely if by tonight you are not in your grave. By tonight. And so this powerful, courageous man of God ran into the wilderness. Terrified. And while he was there in the wilderness of Beersheba, we take up our reading in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 9. This is what occurred. There he went into a cave and spent the night, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, 
and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? This was absolutely the worst time in Elijah's life. Like many of us have felt from time to time, he thought he was isolated and he was terrified because of it. God was not in the wind, as powerful as it was. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. Now, of course, he was bringing them about but in the original Hebrew text, it was saying the voice of God was not in the wind. The voice of God was not in the earthquake. The voice of God was not in the fire. Why do you suppose an all-powerful God chooses to speak in a whisper? He could, after all, force us to listen, couldn't he? He could generate a voice so powerful and so overwhelming that we would be driven to our knees in submission and listen whether we wanted to or not. And yet he speaks to us in a whisper. Because it is his desire that we choose to listen, follow, and obey. Much the same as those of us who have adult children. I've reached the age in my life where it is no longer appropriate for me to tell my adult children what they must do. And that's taking some getting used to. But it's their responsibility now. It is the life that God has given them. And any of us who have adult kids now, we know it's inappropriate for us to come in and say, hey, you ought to do this, or you need to rearrange your living room and change jobs, and why don't you dress better? And do, you know, Those are their things. And it's God's desire for us to listen to His wisdom and His instruction and obey it, having chosen to, rather than being forced to. Whispering matters. When God spoke to Elijah, it was in a whisper. Whispering, you see, is intimate. Whispering requires us to be silent. And the more we want to hear what is being said, the more quiet and still we have to become. Therefore, silence, both literally and figuratively, is the key to hearing God speak. The psalmist has written in Psalm 46.10, this is where we're going sermon outline from. You know this verse. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Let's let that verse fall apart into an outline for us for just a few moments. First of all, be. To hear the voice of God, just be. You are, after all, designed to hear His voice. Even people who deny His existence are created in His image and indwelt with a predetermined need to hear Him. That's why people who reject God go through life angry and bitter and miserable. I don't need God. I don't believe in God. Because they are denying way they're made. And it leaves them that way. Just be who you are. Just be. We need to be who we are. And who, after all, are we? We are created in God's image, Genesis 1 tells us. 
Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you I have a corner on what that actually is. Scholars and theologians much smarter than me have debated that for centuries. Here's what I know, though. There is something created in you that looks just like God. And it's not in anything else in creation, only in humanity, is that placed. There is something in you that looks just like you. It's not God. It never will be God. You are not divine. I am not divine. However, there is something in us that separates us from all the rest of creation because it is God's image. It is, in effect, His mark, His thumbprint on us. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. We talked about this with the children last Sunday. You are fearfully made because God was very careful. He was not scared. He was just careful. Well thought out. Planned with a purpose. Specifically made. You as an individual are carefully made. And you are wonderfully made. He spared nothing. God went crazy. I mean, if you look around the rest of creation, he, he really did a bang-up job, didn't he? I mean, have you looked at the animal kingdom, for example? Look at, who comes up with giraffes? God did amazing things, and his creative abilities and his variety in thought is awesome. But only in humanity did he come forward in Genesis 1.31 and say, now it's very good. Everything else was good. Everything else was fine. Everything else was perfect. Just the way he made it. But only with humanity did he say, now creation is not just good, it's, it's very good. In other words, God himself said, this is my best work. That's who you are. And in John 15, 16, Jesus reminds us that he chose us. We are chosen. This does not elevate us. This does not make us better than. This is no cause for ego. But it is cause for rejoicing. Jesus picked you. If we're choosing sides on a playground for a game of kickball or some other game that kids play, you will never be the last one chosen as long as Jesus is the captain. He chose you. He put his life on it. And in order to hear the voice of God, first you and I must accept who we are. We must be. Not who we think we are. Not who others think we are. Not even who we want to be, who we are in Him. Secondly, be still. <clears throat> now, this one's hard. Stop. Do you struggle with stopping activity? With just being still? How many times a day do you think, I am tired. I've got so much to do. There are so many demands on me. Well, who put those there? Stop. In the New American Standard translation of this passage, I love the way it represents it. It means kind of the same thing, but with a little more flavor. Cease striving. Stop. You are not going to impress God, neither am I. He's not going to love you more because you're a good kid. He's not going to love you less because you're bad. Stop. Cease striving. There is an element of Sabbath in this. And because we're not Jewish, we in the Christian church don't observe the Sabbath, which correctly happens on the seventh day, which, of course, would be Saturday. So some would say, well, you're worshiping on the wrong day. No, no, it's not that at all. The Sabbath was never meant to be legalistic. It was never meant to be this this hard, fast rule. See, that's what we do with God. We try to make this limitless, infinite God into a, a series of do's and don'ts and a list. And if I do this stuff, then I'm good. Just like the remix that we read about. We try to put God in our order. And Jesus very profoundly said in Mark 2.27, the Sabbath was made for humanity. Human beings were not made for the Sabbath. The seventh 
day, the day of rest, the day of stopping, is vital to who we are and who we are made to be. Stop. Be still. We could also say be silent. Many of you are probably familiar with Beethoven's Symphony No. 5 in C minor. It is perhaps his most famous work among all the amazing things that he did. The reason it's the most famous of his works is the hook. Dun, 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 dun. Everybody knows that. Oh, that's Beethoven. <laughs> Everybody knows that. But what a lot of people don't know is that when Beethoven wrote that symphony number five, he inserted an eighth rest right at the beginning of the whole piece. An eighth rest. Why would you start a song with nothing? And here's why he did it. If you've ever been to a concert of a, of a symphony orchestra, right up to the actual performance, the noise is terribly distracting. People are talking and they're milling around and doing their stuff. And up on the stage, the whole orchestra is tuning. And it sounds like nobody's got a clue what they're doing. It's just all these things and all da 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 And then the, the conductor walks up and taps the podium and it's time to begin. Everyone comes to attention. They're ready to go. Beethoven knew, however, that the human ear needs to be cleansed every once in a while, just like your palate does. And so he said he put that eighth rest at the beginning of symphony number no. five to cleanse everybody's ear from all the other stuff so that no one would miss bum, 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 bum. Stop. Be silent. There is a time to be silent, Ecclesiastes tells us. Silence is, in fact, proactive listening. I talk for a living. Therefore, noise is an occupational hazard for me. And there are times where I need to, at the risk of being impolite, shut up. Listen to our community. Listen to the sounds of nature around us. Listen to things that as long as there are other voices speaking, you'll never hear. Listen if you, if you dare for the voice of God. You see, silence is the difference between sight and insight. Silence is the difference between happiness, which is temporal, and joy which is down deep. Silence is the difference between fear and faith. Be still. And in order to hear the voice of God, you and I must accept who we are and be still before Him. <coughs> and then finally, the whole verse, be still and know that I am God. Now, this sounds wonderful. We think of that, oh yes, be still and know. I want to hear the voice of God. This is how you do it. Be still and know that I am God. It is a matter of faith and submission. You see, in faith, we believe there is a God. That's a faith step. I'll grant you that. In faith, we believe there is a God. In submission, we acknowledge that we are not Him. Both are necessary if we're ever going to hear his voice. I want you to notice that God did not speak intimately with Elijah until Elijah was ready to listen. And sometimes I think that the reason the wind and the earthquake and the fire had to come first is because Elijah was whining. Granted, he was in a tough spot. But why did he and why do we, because we often do the very same thing, Feel the need to tell God how bad he had it. Oh, Lord, I'm the only one faithful. I'm all you've got. They've killed all the other prophets, and now they're trying to kill me too. They destroyed your altars. They're bad, God. And it went on and on. I get the, the sense. It just went on and on and on. And the wind and the earthquake and the fire might have just been 
in there to get Elijah to shut up and listen. Not because God was not concerned with how he felt. Don't, don't misread that. But because God was ready to move him through that by speaking directly to him. Now, when Elijah was ready to listen, God whispered directly to him. You see, that's the thing about a whisper. You have to lean in. You have to get closer to the one who's whispering. What we're talking about here, my friends, is intimacy that leads to hearing God's voice directly in our spirit. But we have to ask ourselves, do I really want to hear the voice of God? It's risky. It's a little dangerous, I warn you. Do I trust Him? Do I really trust Him? You used to have a football coach in high school that said, you know, don't ask a question if you can't handle the answer. If God is going to speak to me and to you, He's going to tell us something. You're not going to waste time. Do I trust Him enough to accept what He says? Am I ready to surrender my own plans and lay them over to Him? Will I listen to Him? And having listened, will I obey Him? Because Scripture teaches once we hear God's voice, we become accountable for it. In order to hear the voice of God, we must accept who we are. Be still before Him and be ready to listen to Him. Honey, when you go to the piano, we're not going to play during the reflection time. Just be ready with the responsive song, okay? Are you ready to pray Samuel's prayer? Samuel said, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. And so I invite you for a few moments of silence, which you may not get for the rest of the week unless you're intentional about it. Be still. No. Very, very quiet. I'm hunting wabbits. <laughs>